Um, hello everyone, welcome to the seventh day of SGU, the special track workshop. Today we have the honor to uh, have the speech of Luisella. Uh, Luisella Giulici, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, I'm sorry if I'm mistaken. Uh, so she is a systems uh, manager at the uh, European Space Agency for the Copernicus program. Copernicus is the largest worldwide uh, operational Earth observation program to date, funded by ESA and European Commission. She has a master's with honors a degree in electronics engineering from the University of Florence, Italy, and master's in space systems engineering from the University of Delft, Netherlands. Uh, she worked as research fellow at CERN in Switzerland before joining ESA in the Netherlands. In the early phases of her career, she was responsible for defining and managing R&D programs for the aerospace applications of GPS technology and for guidance navigation and control systems. Since then, she has held several technical and programmatic management positions in space projects from definition to development, launch and in orbit exploitation of space missions. These include ASARS Cosmos Mercury Land Lander Study, ESA JAXA BP Colombo, Smart One, the first European Moon mission, ESA NASA LISA Pathfinder, EU ESA Copernicus Sentinel 1 SAR Imaging Mission, ESA EU UMETSAT, NASA, NOAA, uh, Kines Coper Copernicus Sentinel 6, Jason CS project, and uh, an operational ocean surface topography mission. Luisella has authored many scientific and technical papers and has been associate editor for several applications and scientific journals. In addition, throughout her career, Luisella has uh, actively participated in several professional organizations like uh, AIAA, International Federation of Automatic Controls, American Astronautical Society, and Council of European Aerospace Societies. Mm -hmm. is a fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society and is an associate fellow of the AIAA, and she's currently a member of the AIAA Board of Trustees. She also, she's also a member of the AIAA Finance International Activities and Honors and Awards Committees. Her extensive and unique experience in board of directors and in governance of non-profit uh, non association together with her passion for promoting diversity in the work environment brought her to lead women in aerospace Europe. Thank you so much for joining us and the floor is yours. Thank you, Venus. Thank you very much for your introduction and uh, to go through all my bio, <laughs> thoroughly. Indeed, I'm here today. I work at the European Space Agency, but I'm here today in my capacity of President of Women in Aerospace Europe. Um, and let's say I, I'm an engineer by background and I feel much more comfortable talking about space mission and technology normally than issues like diversities. Uh, however, uh, from the very early stage of my career, I was, uh, let's say, engaged in, in reflection regarding my profession, aerospace, but also diversity and gender diversity in particular. When I joined ESA now already more than 20 years ago, <laughs> I soon realized that I was often the only woman in the meeting room, whether I was in Aztec or in ESA, or I was traveling to one of the aerospace company in Europe. So uh, that's why, I, that's what brought me also to, to be more and more engaged on the issue of diversity and try to understand why uh, when I was at university, there were, there were not so few women that studied math, physics, and engineering. But when I, ca when I came to the profession of aerospace, when I came to, to my work environment, I ended up being pretty lonely and really a, a, a rare species, uh, species uh, in a way. So, um, let's, uh, so I would like to tell you a bit about myself 
about the statistics, about the history also of women in aerospace, not at the association per se, but who have been, who are the few role models that we have seen in the past. Why we have an association like women in aerospace and other association of similar nature or that share the, the, the same, let's say, objectives. And why, especially for young professionals, I would say, is important to be uh, to participate and to be a member of professional association. This is a little, the plot of my on of my on my speech. Going to uh, to let's look let's look where we stand now. I mean, this is already ten years ago. Ten years ago, the Economist dedicated a cover page to. Uh, the women issue, the gender issue, saying, look, we made it. We made it because the workforce in the US uh, is 50% composed by uh, women. Now, um, also, the, the majority of the graduate students in the world, and we are talking about 10 years ago, were women. Now, uh, looking a bit more into the numbers, this 50% was not really reflected in the management, in the senior management level, where still only 2% in the US and 5% uh, in the UK were actually members of the boards or, uh, or in leading position anyway. Uh, still talking in general about all type of profession, uh, the statistics uh, shows that there is an average of 25% female in senior management position. And there is a very wide distribution, like in China, we can find 50% when we talk about senior management position, while in the Netherlands, where I live, uh, we have a 10%, around 10%. And why there is all these differences, for instance, from the Netherlands to Poland, where we have, again, we have quite a high, high number of uh, women in senior uh, management position. So there is a widespread and there is a lot of question. And this is the profession, all type of professions. Now, looking more into uh, narrowing the, 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 our look into the STEM uh, type of profession, we, um, we have statistics that are regularly collected by the European Commission. Every three years, they publish a report, and uh, it's called the She Figures. And through these reports, we can uh, conclude that there are 45% of PhD uh, students that are female, and 30% graduate in STEM. But then, when we look at the aerospace sector, we go down to 10%. And this is not just Europe, because I've looked into statistics uh, from the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, which is a large, as you may know, a, a, probably the largest uh, uh, professional organization dedicated to the aerospace sector, and include members from university, uh, from um, industry, from government, uh, uh, space agencies, etc. And looking at the membership, again, we find that just 10% of the membership of this association is female. So there is actually a, well, an issue. And why there is an issue? Because right now, especially the aerospace sector, need the best talented people, whether they are female or male. Okay? And we are clearly losing some very uh, important potential that is out there and that instead of pursuing a profession in uh, aviation or space, goes to other, other uh, uh, field or uh, other scientific field. So why that? Okay, I, I, I'm not a psychologist. There is plenty of studies out there. Uh, I never dare to, let's say, to, to explore this or to make my own conclusion out of these psychological um, studies. Uh, well, I, you may know this book, you know, Men are from Mars and uh, Women are from Venus. Well, I haven't read the book, 
So I, I don't know what is inside, but I've done my own study in uh, regarding space. So I've looked how many Mars missions there are out there. Uh, there have been launched at least until uh, a few years ago. How many Venus mission? And yes, I think uh, that uh, men are from Mars and women are from Venus, definitely. Uh, but let's 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 go back to 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 our role models to. The people who may inspire us, that have inspired us in the past or now. The, the road has been very difficult for women all the way. And, and, uh, but there are some, uh, some quite capturing examples. Starting from Hypatia, that was the first, first mathematician that ended up and built the first astrolog, uh, ended up being uh, killed by a mob uh, for blasphemy. Uh, follow other a number of uh, astronomers because these are also in very interesting figures. Normally, uh, working together with a male astronomer, whether the, the, the husband or the or the or a family members, and doing all the mathematical calculation on the background. So, for instance, uh, 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 Elisabetta Caterina Hoffman. Um, basically was working with the husband and only when he died she finished his work and so it was clear it was clearly recognized as a, a very prominent uh, uh, astronomer we have uh, herschel carolina lucrezia herschel which is the, the, the sister of the famous uh, william uh, herschel uh, she Get her, she gained her notoriety though, and she became the first woman to be awarded as uh, by the Royal Aeronautical Astronomical Society. Um, later on in the US, another example of astronomer, Maria Mitchell. She grew up in a family of Quaker. I think I pronounced this correctly, I hope so. And, um, and actually that, uh, that community at that time, it was very egalitarian. Believed that uh, the two sexes had the, the, the same, the same capability and the same, uh, uh, and deserve the same chances. So she could study and she could, could pursue her, uh, her passion, and she became also very notorious. More recently, is uh, Vera Rubina that has studied the, the uh, made a great contribution to the theory of the dark matter, and again. She was the first woman after Caroline Herschel to be awarded by the Royal Aeronaut Astronautical Astronomical Society. So again, um, there, are many, there were many probably women out there, but they are always a step back and very rarely have been recognized by the community. Um, Let's come more to the to our field. I mean, uh, the aeronautical side. Of course, this is more belong to this century. Though there are, um, let's say, there are examples of a few uh, interesting figures like uh, Sophie Blanchard, that was the first French aeronaut called aeronaut, uh, meaning a she was flying a balloon. She was um, nominated by Napoleon like the, the aeronaut of the official festival. She was very, again, very popular, very no, notorious. She has traveled all over Europe uh, giving her show. She unfortunately died uh, in one of these shows in Paris while uh, the air balloon uh, filled with hydrazine went on fire. But again, she, she gained a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, popularity at that time. Then comes the, the era of the, of the aviation. So the first, women's, uh, first women uh, in a flying, a flying plane. And probably the most famous figure is Amelia Herard. She was the first woman to fly across the Atlantic Ocean just after Lindbergh. And uh, she has many other records. To, to finance her her, her, her passion, uh, she had to, let's say, do many different other jobs, like writing, she was a writer, she was uh, promoting uh, merchandise, um, she was uh, associate editor of magazine, many 
uh, many other activities, but she gained a lot of popularity. And also she served a lot for the cause of women uh, at that time and uh, got very close to the uh, presidential family, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt in particular, and that helped her to promote again the, uh, the, the cause of the, of the women and she built the first association for a women pilot. She became also uh, very famous because of her disappearance. She disappeared while she tried to circumnavigate uh, the, the world. Her plane uh, was lost in the middle of the, of the uh, Pacific Ocean. I like what, what uh, a quote from her, women like men should try to do the impossible. And when they fail, their failure should be the challenge for others. So this is, I think, is something that is valid for, for everybody, men and women. But I think it's, it's a quite a nice, strong message from Anne. Uh, other, other pilot, other aviator, the first uh, UK uh, women pilot, Amy Johnson. Again, uh, both of these have quite a tragic end because also she died in, a, in, a, in an accident, in a plane accident. But she was, during the Second World War, she was part of the Air Force as first pilot in the Air Transportation Auxiliary Unit. Uh, the youngest pilot instead uh, is Eleanor Smith. She became a pilot at the age of 16. Imagine, we are talking about the early uh, 19th, uh, 20th century. So she was a pilot in uh, 1927. Uh, uh, so really, uh, really strong personalities that pursue their passion and they also continue. I mean, she has a, a very long list of achievement. And then they also promote the issue of uh, equality and diversity in their, uh, in their field. Well, this is a well-known uh, um, if we move to, from aviation to space, it is uh, the well-known Valentina Tereskova. Again, uh, she is a hero in her country, general, the first general woman in, in, in Russia, the first astronaut, and uh, that was uh, uh, in 1963. Um, I have here a collection because I have a collection of, of astronauts, uh, women astronauts, the first Italian one, the first French, the first Isa, the first uh, Afro-American, uh, first captain of, 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 the, of the space shuttle, uh, the first astronaut Sally Ride, uh, and so on. These are our rock star, the rock star of our profession, we can, we can call it, because they are very uh, let's say important also in terms of public relation and they are very well known by the wider public. Of course, there is many more people working, many more women in the past that have worked for, for the profession. But even in the, in the rock star area, so in the uh, astronaut side, uh, the diversity is, is not yet there. And the statistic shows that actually the percentage are very low. Now, things are changing. I've heard uh, the NASA administrator, the new current NASA administrator, that the ne next astronaut corp will be 50% female and 50% male. And that he, he wants to send a female astronaut in the moon, to the moon on, with, the first, uh, with the first moon, moon mission for uh, 2024. Now, again, there are many hidden figures behind and they were in the past. For me, this movie was very emotional because I could see, I could recognize many things that you would think they don't exist now, but that I have witnessed, if not experienced myself, I've, I've witnessed also with, with other people. And, uh, uh, and that's why an association like Women in Outer Space exists. Now, Women in Outer Space Europe is part of a, a global network. It was founded in the US first, and now there are several branches, including the one in Europe. The one in Europe was founded 10 years ago, 11 years ago now, and, uh, and, has, been, and has grown since then enormously. We started with 60 members, now we have 600. We have all the major uh, corporations 
and uh, an association that are partner, including uh, the SCGA, um, the SGAC, which are, we are very proud of, actually, and uh, that's the opportunity for us to discuss this matter today. Um, so it was founded 10 years ago by Simone Di Pippo, which is uh, uh, director of the UNOSA in, in Vienna, and Claudia Clerc. As I said, we have grown enormously in the last 10 years, and this because there is the need, there is, there is, uh, there is an interest on the topic, and there is a need. And that what has clustered all these interests also around our association, which is not the only one dedicated to this uh, matter, but uh, for Europe is probably the largest one. Um, we not only promote professional development in aerospace, advocate the space program, but we want also to recognize the women, women achievement in our sector, because we think the role models are really important, especially to attract the younger generation. We want to show that it's possible, and there are uh, prominent uh, women that have uh, done an excellent job and so the environment is is, uh, is let's say um, open and uh, and our profession which is a wonderful profession if we think about like we can think about the astronaut but there are many aspects of our profession that are really really appealing uh, they can they can they can join us they can be part of uh, of this dream so we again we promote uh, um, women in leadership position, we promote STEM, uh, we collaborate with other uh, associations, and we try to, uh, let's say, to help uh, the community. The community meaning men and women, not just the women, men and women and the aerospace community, that's our uh, environment. Um, the, uh, the association is like for any other association, we have, uh, we have formally, uh, in, um, register in the Netherlands. We have a board with all various uh, activities, uh, primarily uh, corporate, professional development, international relation, communication, uh, individual membership, and regional, regional uh, activity. We have also started a, a research program uh, recently where we try to collect data and to provide to our members, whoever, companies or individual members, information and uh, tools to improve this, uh, the gender balance and diversity in, in, their, in their own uh, environment. We have also, uh, we are very proud also of our um, award, and grant, um, um, award and grant program. We offer uh, students uh, the possibility to join uh, conferences and we provide some funding for that, uh, as well as uh, we recognize, as I said, outstanding achievement or individual that are prominent in our, in our profession. And then we have also prize for young professional uh, in, in students, in, in, in student, the student. Now, um, as I said, the peculiarity of women in aerospace, which, are, which is not peculiar because also uh, SGAC has a regional distribution. So we have a regional distribution within Europe, we have local group, and these are very key for our association because they cluster the interest, they connect, uh, they create the networking uh, platform uh, everywhere in Europe where they are present. And also this network of local group is growing at the moment. We have now Barcelona, a um, couple of years ago, uh, the UK group um, was created and they are very, very active. And I would say that these are the backbone of, backbone of, of our association uh, from the point of view of the activities of uh, getting together the community, helping, women and men to succeed in their, uh, in their activity in the local area. Now, networking, professional development and recognition are probably the three pillar of, uh, of our activities. And this is done, as I said, at local level as well as at, uh, at um, um, association level. The, uh, 
the backbone also financially speaking of our association is given by the corporate membership and we have as you can see i cannot i don't go through the list we have the major space agencies and uh, companies in europe and that is very important this is a support that is essential uh, means that the work we are doing is of help for them to internally to the, their uh, corporation uh, achieve also the goal of uh, diversity and inclusion partnership this is uh, is something that is i i believe strongly in this in this activity i mean partnership with other association which share some common goal are essential to succeed we are partnered with the united nations on the for, with the space for uh, space for women project and with many other associations and that that is key to do uh, to to provide also to our member um, wider platform of network and also some financial advantages we have many cooperation with the universities where universities offer to our member discounts when they register for executive courses or uh, like isu is, is one of them uh, though it's not listed anymore here is in our corporate uh, uh, group but it is one of a um, very important partner especially again for young professional and, and students so we hope that in uh, 10 years time uh, this association doesn't exist anymore we don't need women in aerospace europe anymore this would be our dream but let's put it this way we hope that at least in 10 years time there are so many there are many uh, women that are uh, leaders that are astronauts that are so the, the, there is there is there isn't a gender issue any longer and and they can think about something else dream about something else of achieving other new uh, and higher and more ambitious goal now uh, this is for women in aerospace but i would like to spend a, a few more words regarding membership you know you you are also as well are an association are an organization that uh, pretty much uh, a volunteer, uh, most of um, the most part. I personally believe, or I personally experienced, and so I, I think that it is very important, especially, I would say, especially for women, but not only, to join professional association. And, uh, and uh, why? especially in the space sector, but also in aviation. When we are talking about, when we talk about our profession, we talk about missions or projects that may last over 30 years. For instance, someone who work in, worked in Rosetta, the feasibility study was in the 80s. The mission was approved in 93. It took 10 years to build the mission. Then another a few more years to to, to uh, reach the comet and so on, end of mission 2015. So one could work in one, in one mission and basically being in a very close community, which limit, especially in the case of women, limit the possibility also to expand both their knowledge, but also the possibility to, to uh, let's say, evolve their career. Uh, so being part of an association, whether it's women in aerospace, I'm here, I give you the, my example, the, my involvement with the, um, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. At the early stage of my career, it was when I joined AIAA, I was into R&D. And so I was more focused on technical knowledge. And through the association, I could acquire this technical knowledge meet the best people in the world on certain subjects, discussing things with them. So be part of this network, having, have material available, and join conferences that were pertinent to my work. While my work evolved from, let's say, the more technical side to the management side, to mission development, also my role within AAA has moved forward. And I would say it was a way for me also to 
mm-hmm. build on uh, to build my professional my my skills my management skills i could uh, exercise these management skills not only on my daily job but also learn and exercise them to my uh, membership with the AAA. So I've grown, I've grown into the organization with different roles and learning a lot, giving back a lot as well, but learning a lot. And this, this has been uh, somehow key to, to uh, uh, progress also in my, in my career. So uh, being part of, uh, of an association like uh, Women in Aerospace, SGAC or AIAA or any other IEEE or any other association is really an opportunity to to be part of a professional community at all, in in a, in, a, in a larger sense, not belonging simply to a company or a or a space agency or a university. One become part of a larger community is an opportunity to develop the, the technical as well as the leadership skills and to demonstrate them through the work that one look, also all of you do, do within uh, the association, having this global network and being recognized by the community. I mean, awards are, uh, are important. In Europe are less, cons- uh, well, in the US are, are considered much more than, than probably we do here, or it's at least a certain company and corporation value the, 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 the awards, but they are actually really important to be recognized by the community at large for what we have done in our profession. And also, of course, is a source of information. It depends, of course, on each of the individual to, this, to see. The more you invest in, a, in an association, the more you get back. That is the, the equation. <laughs> and that's uh, the... Uh, I proved myself, but I've seen it also for others. With that, I would like simply to invite you to join uh, Women in Aerospace, or not necessarily to become a member, but to join our activities and our events. We have, uh, like many, like many of us, like not today, we have moved. Uh, to a virtual platform that has been proved very successful in the last months. So we are now exploiting different way of communicating and connecting the community uh, and connect to the community as well. This concludes my presentation. If you have um, questions or you would like to discuss any specific topic. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was very informative. So we have a couple of questions from Yulia. Uh, so she says, uh, Luisella, thank you for the very informative and inspiring presentation. We need more of those. When you show role models, I can't help but ask you, yourself being a role model, what advice do you have to the young space uh, get to advance in their careers? To, so people from our generation who want, to, I mean, the young generation, they want to be active uh, in the space sector and advance in their career. So what uh, advice do you give them as a role model? Uh, there is a quite, uh, again, it, it is a difficult profession and, uh, and it's a steep road normally. Um, the uh, engagement, uh, as I just mentioned, engagement on a professional association is one of the ways to, uh, to learn and to advance. You need to have the right mentors and uh, you need to have the right inspiration. You need to have the role model to meet them, to talk to them, to have them coaching, even if it's not a formal coaching or a formal mentoring. It is still an exchange that allows you, allows each of us to, to, to advance, to understand better where we want to go, to have the right network when, uh, when trying to find a job somewhere else or on a specific area that can be of interest, and, uh, and and to be to be perseverant in you know what you're doing, what is your passion. This is a really Fundamental. 
I'm muted. Okay. So we have another follow up question from Yulia, and then I see Ben also wants to ask a question. So Yulia also asked, What advice do you have for us, the group who is working on diversity and gender equality, to effectively address these global issues? Um, I took like I took this uh, commitment of uh, women in our space because, as I said, I've been reflected all my life through uh, my professional life about that because I've, I've experienced, I've seen uh, even if not on me but on others how this or on the environment how this works. So, um, so the the the, the uh, create awareness and is the first step make your environment aware that there is a disparity because there is there is an, an unconscious bias and there is this is even even with us women i mean the unconscious bias is there uh, for everybody it's not that men have an unconscious bias versus women also women have an unconscious bias versus women is <laughs> is common that's what uh, what I have uh, is, uh, noticed. So try to be as much, try to create this uh, environment of awareness is the first step. Being very assertive in your, uh, in your in the way you proceed in your career uh, and try to find the, uh, let's say, the champion in the profession. So the men and women, which are probably a Two higher, two level higher than higher than you are in and in the organization, but they can help you to grow, and that believes in you. That is uh, probably uh, one of the key to success, uh, which I've seen for both men and women, by the way, is to find people that believes uh, you can do it and will uh, give you the space to do it, and then that, that will uh, will determine the possibility to to advance. That's very true. Thank you so much. So Ben, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Thank you so much. This was a really informative presentation, really well put together. Um, I was, we've talked a lot about data um, and transparency of companies for talking about the data of their gender equity practices. And you mentioned that your research group is looking into that. Have you ever seen, have you experienced any pushback with companies or organizations being transparent? Um, and kind of what are some of the ways that we can encourage them to be more transparent? The problem, the problem I see is that, um, well, transparency is definitely a problem. And it was probably 10 years ago, more than now. Now there is such a push for uh, diversity and inclusion in general that company, especially company that are very much financed, sponsored by, by uh, public money and the aerospace sector very much is, is in, the, in this, fall in this category, they, they need to provide data. They need to show that they achieve some sort of a, a goal in terms of um, some internal, they have to have their own internal goal and that they have to demonstrate that these goals are met. Therefore, the data are more available. But again, data or statistics can prove everything, you know. Uh, and I say everything, even the truth, because I think the data I'm producing, I see the data in, in my, uh, my perspective. Some other people like put together data or some company, or even ESA at the beginning was putting together a gender uh, equality statistics that included uh, administrative assistant and services. And of course, in that category, you find a higher percentage of, at the time, for sure, even a much higher percentage of women. Was, all the, the administrative assistant were actually a female, almost all. So, and then the statistic is polluted. <laughs> so you, you see a 20, 25%, but in reality, you have uh, just a 5% of scientists and 10% uh, of engineer there. So also data need to be really uh, 
explored, analyzed, investigated. We need to know what are the sources, how they're, uh, how they're put together, etc. So it's a very tricky, to, to, to wrap up the, the answer, it's very tricky not only to get the data, but also to have an insight of how the data have been uh, built and put together. Okay, yes, Ben, please. Uh, this is, thank you for your presentation. It's kind of a follow-up question uh, to Ben's. Um, we all realize the importance of data to come up with strategies to include diversity, but what, um, what metrics do the w, WIA use to get data? Um, and do you have that information on your own organization? It may be on the website, but I don't think I can find it. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, well, um, I, I can pull out the data. So, our, first of all, our association is open to men and women. Eh? Indeed, in our board of directors, we have uh, uh, two, two men. Uh, and uh, it, is, it is very important for us. This is not a, 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 a club. And so, I don't have the statistic, the exact statistic on the gender of our membership is probably a, a small fraction of men that are members. Uh, again, we try also with the example of our board to show that, uh, to attract also uh, more uh, men to work with us, because I think we have really a common goal. When I'm saying that if we want to go to Mars in 2024, first of all, we need the money. Second, we need the talent and we need the capabilities. So we cannot uh, just uh, pick on half of the population. We really need to get the best mind, the best engineers, the best scientists that are out, out there. And we know that from the university, the pool is much larger than what we see then in the workplace. We need to, it's our common goal to achieve this big project. And for that, we need to everybody. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question from Vicky. She's one of our delegates and uh, she is a member of the Brooke Owens Fellowship Program. So she's asking, how do you navigate the belief that some people hold that many women or minorities are given opportunities because of their merit and not because of their identity. Sorry, can you repeat the beginning of the... Uh, yes, so she's asking how we can navigate the belief that some of the people uh, hold that many women or minorities are giving the opportunities because of their merit and not because of their identity. Because for example, if there are quotas that are given to women, so their selection is not based on their uh, like qualifications, but they are selected because they, an organization maybe needs this certain um, number of women. Am I asking it correctly, Wiki? I think this is a just um. I think I might have actually typed it wrong. So okay. the issue, sorry, it's early. Um, the issue is that I have noticed is that a lot of people will say that, um, for example, with the whole sending the first women uh, astronauts to the moon, uh, the pushback is that they're only being sent because they're women and not because they're fully talented, qualified individuals who worked hard to deserve it. Um, so I guess how do you navigate that belief? Because a lot of people believe that. Yeah, but you know, people believe what they want to believe, and uh, and uh, it is impossible to change the mind of uh, one hundred percent of the people around you. That's why I was saying before you need to be very assertive. If you are competent, you're capable, you do your job well. That's it. Then, well, yeah, it happened that you are a woman or you are black or you are belonging to a certain community or minority and uh, there will be always a percentage that will point finger point that and uh, focus on that aspect and may say that uh, 
unless evidently the company has a, a, a quota type of uh, uh, a strong quota, which doesn't exist, by the way. I, I don't. Even when the administrator says that the NASA administrator says that they want to send the uh, women, to, and so what? I mean, there are as many PhD students as men are, are as uh, female as, ma as male. So I, I expect that there is a percentage of application. There should be at least a percentage of application that is more or less equal. So probably, yes, they can find a very competent woman and a very competent man to send to the moon. And uh, that's great. And someone will always say, oh, she is there because she's a woman. That said, there are other two observations I would like to make. For sure, for instance, the work that I've been doing is not something that is not necessarily seen positively, you know, in, in a, it seems that you want to do, you, you want to build your career just based on the fact that you are a woman, which is not the case, but, but a certain percentage will always believe that. And the other observation is that, okay, um, uh, in any environment, we need a critical mass to stop this type of uh, consideration. And this, I have seen it also in my, on my, in my work environment, in the agency or uh, in, other, uh, in other environment. When there is, when the minority, whoever, whatever is the minority, women, again, black, etc., uh, is whatever type of minority. If there is that one person that enter into the community, the first women that work in the department, the first women that is project manager, the first, then the spotlight are there. And, and there is a large percentage of people ready for the mistake. And the mistake will be emphasized. Uh, so this doesn't happen anymore when you reach a critical mass, I call it. And the critical mass, in my opinion, is at least 30%. When there is a diversity that shows that, that there is at least a community that is a mix with, with a certain percentage, then this type of uh, attitude is, 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 is moving somehow. Okay, thank you so much. So we have another question from Yulia. Yulia, do you want to ask your question or shall I read it? I can go with it. Just let me know if it's too loud here in my environment. So the question is about the statistics and maybe what shall we prioritize? So some statistics show that young women enroll in STEM uh, undergrad specializations at the rates of below 20-30% and that's average for the world let's say with some exceptions like last year we've seen from the International Space University a 50-50 but that's really an exception. On the other side we have the statistics like 40% of women quit the tech force within 10 years after the beginning of their careers and that's compared to 17% of men and this is I'm quoting a US statistic and so, of course, ideally, we would need to tackle both issues, and we try to, but which, in your opinion, is the more urgent one to address to be closing the gender gap? I think the retention. The retention of, uh, of uh, female uh, in the STEM uh, profession. In the STEM, I mean, in, in, in aerospace, because I'm working in aerospace, and I would like this improvement in our uh, in our sector, but uh, is the retention of the young professional because okay, the first ten years of uh, career means uh, leaving the university, start working some STEM profession, and then moving out. So um, probably there is some work to be done, and one one factor maybe what I was talking about before that they, there is there isn't that critical mass that allows this individual to progress in their career they find it maybe more difficult or uh, this can be one of the reasons but 
I don't, I don't have, uh, I don't know. But for me, it's the retention. I see that in um, the, in STEM, in the, in the schools, the numbers are, are at least a little bit better than they were, they are improving. Which doesn't mean that we shouldn't work on that area. And I'm saying just to, if uh, it's a matter of focus, I would focus on the retention uh, at this point. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. So do we have any other question from the delegates? Okay, maybe I ask a question myself. So I'm originally from Iran and I have been a national point of contact for Iran and then four years of a regional coordinator for Middle East in SGAC. So what I see is that there are so many cultural challenges uh, in this region. Uh, like as you're part of the uh, board members of uh, uh, women in aerospace, have you seen any like any kind of activities or requests from Middle East region so far, or you haven't seen any activity over there? And what do you recommend for the women in Middle East to start any initiative or something? What do you recommend? I think it's, it's definitely, uh, it would be, first of all, we, we are women in aerospace Europe and there is a regional contest into that. And, uh, and there is the also link to the capability of acting, uh, acting with, within the, the community, in this case, the European aerospace and not even aerospace, the space community, because we cannot do more. And also there are other associations taking care of the aviation side. Um, we are, we are US, so we are, <laughs> the original uh, women in aerospace, uh, uh, basically as a, as a process to accept branches around the world. So my recommendation would be to start uh, in, in a branch of the women, uh, women in aerospace, because again, the, the advantage is that we are also a global network. So I have conversation with the U.S. counterpart, and we exchange ideas and, uh, and activities, or try to at least um, to do so, and, and that is very powerful. So the first step would be if someone wants to create a group to contact we are uh, U.S. Uh, we are in the U.S. Again. Uh, mm, Gender focus group is one aspect, but there are more things that can be done. Going professional association that has a worldwide uh, is another way of doing it, especially if you want to grow in again professionally in some technical or managerial area. I see. Thank you so much. Great. So we have three minutes and do we have any questions? Yes, please, Ben. Just, 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 just a final question. Um, who, would you, who would you recommend following on, on social media as an example of uh, 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 kind of female in STEM? Would you, have, would you know off the top of your head the top three examples to follow? No, I, I wouldn't be able to give you a, a, an answer right now, but it is a good question. Like the question you asked me before, now I will, I will uh, pull out the statistics and I will make sure that are on the, our website. I think it's a, it's a very good tip. I, I, mean, I didn't talk about that before. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you so much. So I think if there's no questions, we can conclude this keynote speech. Thank you so much, Lisa, for accepting our invitation and giving us this honor for your very informative and interesting presentation. I personally learned a lot and I hope all the delegates learned as much as I did. So thank you so much. We appreciate your time and your efforts. And uh, thank you.
thank you all. I've been uh, really interesting and uh, for me as well. It's always interesting to use a Skype for exchange and uh, actually this virtual platform allows it to do a lot and to uh, yes. I'm glad that we will continue with, uh, with the SGAC uh, with other uh, events in the course of this year. Great. Thank you so much. And um, thank you. Great. <laughs> thank you all. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. And uh, I hope you to meet you sometime in person, maybe next year, if, uh, if things uh, come back to normal for the next AIC. Surely. Perfect. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. <laughs>